Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Sarah Gianena. She is Associate Professor of Medicine. She is the Director of Transnational Virology Corps at the Center of AIDS Research at UCSD. So uh, Dr. Gianena, she is a famous HIV researcher and an infectious disease physician with a broad background in transnational virology, molecular biology, and immunology. Uh, she has over 130 publications related to HIV persistence, transmission, and pathogenesis. Um, I was fortunate uh, this year to join um, her last gift project. It is a project uh, lead by Dr. Smith and Dr. Gianena at UCSD. Um, um, basically looking into HIV virology, uh, incorporating autopsy procedures. So um, today we are very fortunate to have her with us and to learn more about her last gift project. Thank you so much uh, for the for the introduction. And uh, I om I'm always excited to talk about the last gift, which is uh, certainly one of the most impactful projects that we were running in our lab. So my name is Sarah Janella, my, my pronouns are she and her. And uh, I let's start with give you a little bit of an overview on the current state of HIV research. Just a few bullet points for those of you that, who might not be familiar with the epidemics. And well, um, I think that overall, we can say that we did huge progress uh, in uh, treating people with HIV over the last years. You know, early on in the epidemics, uh, before we had uh, antiretroviral therapies uh, or like early antiretroviral therapy, a person with HIV diagnosed at age 20 had like maybe 30 years uh, um, maximum to live. While today with antiretroviral therapies, uh, this has basically almost reached the same level as uh, the general population. So this is huge accomplishment uh, because people with HIV right now really can live healthy life if they are, have access to all the therapies they need. Another very positive spin is when that we real, realized recently that a person with HIV who is undetectable and on antiretroviral therapy is, is untransmittable. This has been a huge uh, accomplishment uh, and also in reducing stigma. And uh, um, so that's another huge success in the last years. And on overall, the number of new HIV infection have been decreasing. Like since 2010 to 2017, these are not super updated uh, data, but I couldn't find uh, like a nice figure like this with more updated data. But I think there was almost a 20% decrease uh, in the number of new HIV infections worldwide. So that's another fantastic news uh, uh, when we think about HIV. But uh, in reality, so then so some, some people can ask, right? Why do we even need to cure HIV if everything is working so well? If we can treat people, they can have healthy life, they don't transmit it. Why do we even need to invest so much time in finding a cure? Well, there are still a lot of barriers. Uh, uh, for example, yes, incidence has decreased, but millions of people still have HIV and still millions of people still get HIV and die of HIV every year. And this is particularly true in Sub-Saharan Africa. So even if we are going in the right direction, HIV is still a huge epidemic. Also, antiretroviral therapy is great and works very well, but not everyone has access to it. Like if we look at the casket of care in the US, you can see that only about three fourths of people with HIV are aware of their status. Only 80% have access to treatment and only 80% are actually viral suppressed. This means that even in the US, even with optimal access and health insurance and good medicine, 
still only about half of people with HIV are virally suppressed. And also there is huge stigma, right? Even if we are working towards the stigmatizing HIV, uh, having HIV still carries some stigma. Not everywhere the same, like in California, of course, we are relatively liberal and uh, uh, maybe that's less of a problem, but if you go in, so, in some state in the US or of course like in Sub-Saharan Africa, having HIV is still carries a lot of stigma and people are marginalized and have huge social, economic and legal issues. So, and these are a few of the reasons why actually curing HIV is still a very high priority on the HIV agenda. And uh, so far we have two people that we know of uh, that are likely, they were likely cured of HIV. So both of them uh, uh, obtained, uh, so they, they basically were HIV free after a, a bone marrow transplant. So both patients had leukemia or lymphoma, and then uh, basically they got a bone marrow transplant and then the HIV never came back. In the case of the Berlin patient, who was the first one, the, trans also the doctor who did the transplant had the clever idea to transplant him with a cell from a donor who was resistant to HIV. And that's not the case with Adam Castillejo, but even if the, it's only two cases, uh, this has been huge because it has served as a proof of concept that under some circumstances, HIV can be cured. So Tim, uh, Timothy Ray Brown, uh, he was the first patient that was uh, uh, cured and he was a huge advocate for HIV cure research. He was living here in California, very close. He was in Palm Springs. And unfortunately he died about a year ago, not because the HIV came back, but because his leukemia came back. And his big dream uh, was that he didn't want to be the only person to be cured with HIV. He wanted everyone with HIV to be cured. And so here we are trying to fulfill his legacy. So one of the reasons why it's so hard to clear the HIV reservoir, it because the HIV reservoir is not only in blood, but in, in, it's everywhere. So days and weeks after HIV infections, HIV penetrates every single tissues and likes to play hide and seek with the immune system and basically see its immune cells everywhere. And when I say everywhere, it's really everywhere <laughs> in every single tissue you can imagine. And then uh, if uh, many, after many, many years of antiretroviral therapy, somebody decides to stop antiretroviral therapy, this reservoir serves as a source of rebounding virus. So unfortunately, it's really hard to study HIV reservoirs in tissues. Most of the study that we do, most of the cure study are performed in blood because that's easy to access. And most of the clinical trial only collect blood or very limited tissue like rectal biopsies or some lymph node. But you can imagine it's almost impossible to biopsy a living heart or a living brain. There are a few autopsy studies that have been around forever. The most famous is uh, the uh, NNTC, who are, um, the Neuro Tissue Network. They have one site here in San Diego, uh, and they have been doing autopsy for a very long time in people with HIV. But there, this study has not been designed for HIV cure study. First of all, most of the people do not have very good antemortem characterization because CNTN does not have the resource to uh, follow study participant as close as the last gift. And so often when people die, their closest visit is like six months away. And so we don't have all of the information very close to the time of death. As in particular, we don't know if people have been on antiretroviral therapy until the time of death. And also most autopsy study do not perform autopsy quick enough. So we know uh, from cancer research that the optimal window to preserve uh, cell viability and RNA stability is less than six hours. 
but most of the autopsy from uh, you know the CNTN, for example, are done between 12 and 24 hours after that. That's because they don't have the resource to come in that day and night, and they don't have a large team of committed people that are ready to do a rapid autopsy any time of the day and the night. So this is how oh, the last gift idea was born. So because we wanted to try to address and characterize the HIV reservoir across tissues, uh, David Smith, who is the actual PI of the last gift, uh, uh, had this idea, well, why we don't enroll people with HME with a terminal Ill illness so, so we know more or less that they will die within the next four to six months. And so we can follow them very closely, collect clinical data and blood, and then we perform a rapid autopsy at the time of death. As I told you before, uh, rapid autopsy are done in cancer research. The, one of the big difference between cancer research and HIV research is that most of the cancer rapid autopsy are, are limited in scope because they are only looking for the cancer and surrounding areas. While here we are looking for everything because as I told you before, HIV is everywhere. So our is a very extensive rapid autopsy. So in July 2017, we finally got a grant to fund the last gift. So the main goal of the last gift is to, on one side, characterize the HIV reservoir in blood and across the tissues. And then in, in some of the people that might interrupt antiretroviral therapy, we also wanted to see how the virus comes back and repopulates all of the tissues. Our goal is to enroll about five participants a year. And I put here, we have a web page that we actually very recently refreshed uh, with more information about the last gift. So just to give you a little bit of an idea about the type of data that we collect in the last gift, these are clinical data from last gift one. So usually what we do is we, first of all, collect all of the historical clinical data. And then uh, when they enroll in the last gift, we start doing very uh, regular blood draws. And if you see, for example, uh, last gift one interrupted antiretroviral therapy, and then we kept following him and we were able to collect blood the day before he died. So you can imagine how precious it is to have uh, a blood draws uh, and the virus rebounding uh, in blood the day before and then the rapid autopsy the day after. This is what makes the last gift so special, this unique sampling. So I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, um, an overview about the type of uh, study participants here. So I listed them until last gift 25. And now, now by now, we I think we just enrolled 29 this morning and we have three more on our waiting list. Um, so the last gift has been really successful and uh, uh, we have a lot of interest from the community. And you can see like we have, uh, um, most of our participants are males which is not surprising since in California, the HIV epidemics is driven by gay men. But uh, I'm actually really proud we were able to find four women and one transgender woman. So I say that we are not doing very bad with our last gift in enrollment of women. We can do better, but we still had some. And then you can see the type of diagnosis that we have, like it's very heterogeneous. Most of our study participants have cancer, but we have three ALS. And that is super interesting because ALS, as you know, is a very rare disease. And to the best of our knowledge, it's not really associated with HIV. So I think that this is a casualty and probably because one of the neurologists who sees a lot of ALS patients is a big fan of Last Gift. And he has been just referring us a lot of his patients. Another thing that you can see is that most of the study participants do not interrupt therapy and remain on antiretroviral therapy until the time of death. Then here we collect viral load and CD4 
And then we also have um, um, here is some of them are still in follow up. And I think we did uh, 16 autopsies so far. So one participant last if 10 withdrew, like he we enrolled him and then he decided he didn't want to be part of last gift after all. And so far we lost two bodies. Uh, last gift two, uh, he was uh, a homeless uh, study participants uh, and we followed him, you know, as much as we could, but unfortunately he died in the street and uh, people collected him and they didn't know he was a last gift participant. And so we did not, uh, knew he was dead until many weeks after. And then I think it was last day 14, uh, 13 actually who uh, visited family out of, out of state and then he died while he was there. And so we were unable to recover the body. But also, otherwise uh, we have a very good system in place uh, uh, that at the time of death, the next of kin or the hospital will immediately let us know and then we pick up the body within an hour. Of course, we are always very respectful of the time the family might need to say goodbye to their loved ones. But um, usually by the time the body arrives, we are already set up in the morgue. Uh, Craig, of course, like everyone knows Craig, I'm sure in the pathology department, but he is wonderful and he comes in for us day and night. Uh, whenever we need him uh, and, and then we just go through the autopsy and so far we always were able to make it uh, within the six hour so I'm very proud of that big accomplishments so one participant we even uh, uh, drive in from LA uh, we usually we don't accept participants that are not from San Diego because it's too complicated to move the bodies uh, and still be within the six hours. But this part particular participant, we enrolled him and then he decided to move to LA. And, and we just decided to, to try it and we still made it within the six hours. Uh, so, okay, this is the rapid autopsy team. Uh, so that's actually a part of the rapid autopsy team. The rapid autopsy team is very large. We usually, we usually are between uh, 10 and 11 people working. And after doing so many autopsies, we are really like a well-oiled machine. Uh, I can tell you a little bit of how we do it. Uh, well, a lot of people here have, have experience. Usually when I talk about the rapid autopsy, it's, I'm not talking with pathologists, <laughs> but um, usually what as a Craig takes the various organs, uh, we gave him a list of like 50 different sites that we are interested in. And then he puts them on ice here. And then we have like a, a line of cutters. This means there are people that cut the tissues in very small pieces. Uh, and then uh, sometimes we homogenize tissues as well. We do cell suspensions, uh, depending on how many people are available. Uh, uh, sometimes we do it in on site and sometimes we bring it back and we do it in the lab. Um, we do fresh flea, freeze all of the tissue on site. And then uh, we do all sorts of other correction. We do RNA later, we collect pieces, uh, again, that we do cell suspension so that we can store viably, viable cells for subsequent experiments. So, and again, like usually, so usually it's like between three and four hours and we are completely done. So I, I wanted to give you a little bit of, uh, of a taste of the type of uh, participants uh, that enroll in our study. So we have two participants, Last Gift 1 and Last Gift 5, who gave us permission to share their stories and names and face. So Last Gift 1, this is Tony Bennett, uh, and he was super proud to be our first Last Gift participants. Uh, and he always said that his wish was to become even more famous of the other Tony Bennett. And in this picture, you see him with uh, his husband, Blake, and a cousin. Uh, and he was one of our ALS patients, uh, and he was in hospice uh, for a relatively short time. And 
because he was our first last gift participant and we still too had to figure out a lot of procedures so, like I, I he was really patient with us and uh, i will say that thanks to him uh, we streamlined a lot of our protocols uh, but he loved being part of the last gift uh, he's also part of our promotional videos uh, and uh, um and he was very proud of it actually every time that we visited him uh, like he asked the nurse to shave him and he was clean and oh, oh, you know pretty and it was such a pleasure to be with him and then this is last gift five so his name is mike danielson and uh, interestingly he he also had als uh, and uh, you can see him here with my daughter and my son <laughs> when we went to an anti-GAN protest and he decided to join us. And uh, he was amazing. Like he, he's, he was a publicist in Los Angeles his entire life. And he had the most amazing stories about uh, him meeting Angelina Jolie. And then he met Denzel Washington and he was sharing all of these gossips uh, and about his life. And so we loved visit him and just listen to his story and he was one of the biggest fan of the last gift um, he actually also uh, participated to the end of life option and uh, he was a huge advocate i remember that as he was waiting uh, to be able to go through the process uh, a halt was put on it in California. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, like a judge decided that it was not legal anymore. And he wrote a testimonial that was published on the Annals of Internal Medicine, which is one of the most prestigious journal in our field to describe his story and how painful it was for him as a patient to lose control over his own death as when the law was put on hold. Well, fortunately, the hold was lifted and he was then able to, you know, to go through and uh, uh, he was our first study participant who ex executed the end of life option. So as you can imagine, doing uh, end of life uh, uh, rapid autopsy research uh, has a lot of ethical challenges. So this is why we have a full ethics team working with us. So our uh, lead ethicist is Karina Dubé. She has a lot of experience as, and is working very close with the HIV community. And uh, she has been extremely pro productive. Like these are only four out of like, I think eight or nine paper that she wrote over the last uh, four or five years, uh, all around end of life research. So one thing that I wanted to point out is that everything we do is uh, working worked out very close with the HIV community. So the HIV uh, community advisory board uh, has two representative on the last gift and every single questionnaire or protocol is discussed with them before we implement it. And, uh, um, and so th this makes it particularly interesting, also particularly strong and I think that Sometimes it happens that some people maybe raise uh, some question about, oh, you're enrolling people at the end of life. They might be vulnerable. Uh, you cannot do it, especially early on. They don't raise it so much now anymore because I think people are getting used to the last gift and uh, they know that that's what the community wants. But at the very beginning, we had some reviewer that raised these points and the community, they really stood up for us and they, yeah. Uh, they said, we are not vulnerable, that's what we want, and uh, you cannot decide for us. So we, we really are thankful for the community because without the community, the last gift wouldn't happen, exist. Okay, and now I wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of the uh, type of data that we generate. So we have, so far we have one paper published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation where we basically characterize the HIV reservoir. So this uh, study includes data from six last gift participants. Most of them are virally suppressed, but two interrupted antiretroviral therapy. So basically we sampled uh, blood and tissue, and then we extracted DNA and RNA. 
then we measured uh, the level of HIV via droplet digital PCR. And then we sequenced HIV, the full MF gene via single genome sequencing. And then uh, uh, we performed some fancy bioinformatic analysis uh, to characterize the HIV DNA and look at uh, migration of virus across compartments. Okay, here you can see uh, the viral levels. Uh, every color is like a, a different tissues. And you can see like in this particular patient, uh, like expected, you see that the highest level are in lymphoid tissue and in the gut, which is expected. This particular patient who is last gift three had a very high level in the pancreas which was very interesting because last gift three died of pancreatic cancer. But overall, uh, like HIV DNA level varied uh, between undetectable and uh, almost 700 copy per million cells. The lowest is consistently in the brain. Again, that's not unexpected, but nevertheless, we were regularly able to find some HIV in brain. Uh, these are sequencing data, like we were able to recover a little bit more than 600 intact full-length MF sequences uh, across all study participants. Uh, so a mean of seven sequences uh, for each tissue. And uh, we also recovered tissue from most on the brains. And uh, so here you can just see that all of the sequence for every study participant cluster nicely together. This means we didn't contaminate across study participants. And here, I don't know how familiar people are with phylogenetic trees, and I will try to do my best to, uh, to explain how it looks like. So basically, every uh, little dot is an HIV sequence, and the colors are color-coded by compartment. Like you can see here, all of the blue are lymph nodes, the greens are gut, and then we have, I don't know, yellow is pancreas, red is, PB, uh, is blood. And, uh, um, and they are basically in the tree. So you use some bioinformatic and fancy statistics to create the tree, and then you can see how closely related var the various viral populations are. So a couple of interesting points, for example, here, you can see there is a huge group of HIV sequences that are all basically the same. They are super closely related, but you can see from the various co colors that they are all distributed across the body. So that's very interesting, right? It looks like there is one clone of HIV that migrated everywhere across the body. And then you can see that there are intermixing in a little bit everywhere with uh, various colors. Uh, we also can do more formal uh, compartmentalization analysis uh, to see if the virus is intermixed or compartmentalized. And I don't want to go too much into the data, but it's basically there are, we can see both. We can see some virus is compartmentalized, some virus is intermixed, but so far we didn't find a pattern uh, that stood up about one organ is always compartmentalized, another or organ is all, always intermixed. But I think that's because so far we only analyzed six patients. So this is also another fancy uh, figure that Antoine Chayon, who is our bioinformatics person, did. Here he was looking at migration of HIV across tissues. And uh, this is just two different ways to visualize it. So he was look, uh, doing some Bayesian modeling and he could see if there was evidence of migration from here, these are the source, to here, these are the recipients of the virus. And for example, you can see he found evidence uh, of migration from the lymph nodes uh, a little bit everywhere, from blood a little bit everywhere, but then he also found some very interesting migrations from the occipital cortex into the testis. So uh, there is some more investigation to do, but uh, I think that the take home message here is to see that even in people that are suppressed, uh, 
it looks like there is some movement going on within the viral reservoir. And that might be immune cells that just travel around the body and bring the HIV from one tissue to the other. So this is a similar um, uh, figure from a study participant that interrupted antiretroviral therapy. And you can see there is much more going on, which is expected because as soon as somebody interrupts antiretroviral therapy, the viral starts moving around. And so you can see there is a lot of movement from one tissue to the other. And then uh, we also zoomed in a little bit more in various uh, tissue uh, uh, compartment, like for example, within the brain, within the gut and within the genital tract. And then we analyze uh, uh, at a little bit more on a granular level, what happened, I don't know, between the hippocampus and the basal ganglia or the frontal cortex and the occipital cortex. And here, as I don't say it's unprecedented to be able to look at tissue with such a granularity. And here the genital tract, we really collect everything we can, right? The testes, epididymis, prostate, seminal vesicle, everything. I think that the conclusion of this paper was that, um, so first of all, there is a reservoir as we expected a little bit everywhere and we were not able yet to find a pattern or a distribution. Uh, I think it's very interesting to see that uh, there is migration of HIV reservoir across tissues and even across the blood brain barrier in both people that are on antiretroviral therapy and people that stop antiretroviral therapy. And in people that stop antiretroviral therapy, there is a huge, large clonal HIV RNA population that repopulates all of the tissue throughout the body. Okay, where are we going from here, right? We are still generating lots of data because now we published the first six, but we have 16 autopsies so far. We have a lot of collaborator uh, that are working to generating data. Like we are doing mostly the HIV DNA levels and the sequencing so far, but um, we have collaborators that do all sorts of fancy assay. So we did uh, just uh, resubmitted uh, last summer and a renewal of the P1 for the last gift, which got scored at 22, which is amazing and very likely to get funded, which uh, uh, I'm excited about. Uh, so this means that the last gift will probably have at least five more years of funding. And then we received recently a COVID supplement to create a last gift, a similar study uh, for people that have COVID or for people that are that post COVID vaccination to look at the immune response uh, against COVID throughout tissues. So what we're trying to do moving forward is to move away from uh, studying bulk tissue. So all of the sequencing work that you have uh, seen so far was done on bulk tissue. And uh, we would like to try to do single cell sorting, which of course adds uh, some challenge, uh, as you can imagine. We are already starting to do some, like for example, we have one collaborator that uh, receives a fresh brain and uh, they sort microglia. And we have another collaborator that uh, uh, is sorting CD4 T cells from spleen, but we want to do more and more single cell sorting so that we will be able to sequence the virus within the cells, the single cell population. We would like to add some, uh, look more in the mechanism, like doing integration site sequencing to look at clonal expansion of proviral epigenetic uh, to look at mechanism of silencing of the virus. And then as part of the new P1, we also have a large component where we look at the environment, both the pharmacologic and the immune and environment. So we are looking at the microbiome. We are looking at levels of various drug and antiretroviral therapy. We are uh, running uh, um, immune assay, for example, single cell RNA-seq and CYTOF, uh, and we will also measure level of other viruses. So, um, so a lot of exciting stuff is coming our way. 
and uh, I would like to thank everyone. Uh, uh, well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to the last gift participant uh, for our wonderful community advisors uh, and for the entire last gift team uh, who, you know, like we have a outreach team who is fantastic. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, it's not easy to deal with people that are terminally sick and are next of kin during such a difficult time. But then also our rapid autopsy team uh, who is basically on call 24 seven uh, every day and night uh, to come in and perform the rapid autopsy. Okay, if somebody has any questions, uh, I'm, I'm done with the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing this uh, super interesting study with us and sharing this uh, last gift project with us. We will take some questions from here. Jing Jing, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yes. Steve, Steve Yonius. Thanks, Sarah, for that presentation. I, I, I know it's kind of hard to go back, but like you had patient number 17 was a 51 year old male who didn't go off retroviral therapy. So I was surprised that he passed away from pneumocystis pneumonia. I've always considered pneumocystis pneumonia as a disease of people who have HIV who aren't on therapy. Any idea what was happening there? That's a very good question. And let me go back. Yes, we did have a patient uh, with PGP pneumonia. You know, that's a very good question. And I am not sure why he had PGP pneumonia. Uh, I usually don't know all of the clinical data of the study participants. Uh, um, Susanna, I, I saw Susanna is here. Maybe she remembers. Uh, we also, this is Susana Quinta Garcia, part of the Last Gift team. Um, it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Uh, we record all diagnoses that are um, HIV and AIDS uh, relevant or related. So it may not have been the uh, uh, last final diagnosis, but they would have had um, the um, pneumonia, that particular form of pneumonia sometime uh, during their um, uh, time with us. Uh, and we do have some participants who um, do have uh, those types of um, AIDS related or um, low CD4 count or high viral count types of uh, conditions, depending upon um, how regular their, their care is. and. Um, so that's just kind of a general comment um, about um, our, our participants. But he had 15 CD4 T cells. So I'm not sure what, what was going on with that participant. I, I have to go back and check it while he was on antiretroviral therapy with 15 CD4 T cells. Maybe yeah, it's a my, other, my other question, <clears throat> it would seem very interesting, interesting, sad, but interesting. If you had any patients who had leukemia and you know leukemia complicating HIV, Mm -hmm. and whether or not there's any uh, association of dissemination of the cancer cells themselves in any categories of leukemia, if there's any chance that the cancer cells themselves can carry virus. That's a very good question. We had one study participant uh, that had leukemia last gift four, and uh, we are actually really interested, not only leukemia, but also like overall uh, um, in, uh, in, in uh, cancers, uh, uh, both to look at integration site and see if that can contribute to cancer in any way, but also like the microenvironment around the cancer, if uh, um, if the, it's enriched with HIV. Actually, Davy, and I saw that he's on, by the way, he got a, 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 a administrative supplement uh, to look at the reservoir around cancer and around cancer cell and do integration site. And I know they are working on it. But there is, uh, there is literature out, uh, a few papers. I think there was a very recent science paper from John Mellor where he actually found some evidence that uh, integration might sometimes be the trigger of uh, cancer, cancer cell growth. Thank you for your questions. 
Sarah, I'm just curious, are we, are any other institutions also doing similar projects? Uh, so that's a good question. So to this extent, like the last gift at this time, no. We have at least three or four institutions who actually reached out to us and they would like to do uh, their own last gift. Uh, and we will be super excited to collaborate and share all our protocol. The problem is that um, it's very hard to set up. You need a lot of uh, money and you cannot clone Susanna. <laughs> And, uh, and and so like it's, uh, we, we, we were kind of fortunate here that we piggybacked on CNTN and we were able to get access to Susanna and set it up. We have a huge community advisory board. Like there are some unique mm -hmm. pieces of the puzzle that we have here in, uh, uh, in San Diego that will be hard to reproduce it somewhere else. But there is interest and we hope that at some point uh, more people will join us. Thank you. And one of the reasons why I, I think that having more or less gifts around the country is because we can diversify uh, the population. Like, for example, in San Diego, it's very mm -hmm. hard for us to recruit Afro-American or Black people because uh, we don't have that many. Like, if we could have a last gift in the South, you know, we can uh, uh, recruit more diverse people and more women or so. Yeah, more generic population. Um, but I think this is a, a, a super valuable research project. You know, all the data and the tissue blocks you saved um, for potential, because there's always involving molecular um, techniques coming. So whenever it is available, you can always go back and look at the things you're interested in. So it, it's very, very valuable, all the tissues from the rapid autopsy. Yeah, we, we do have uh, a lot of tissue stored that we are willing to share. Like if somebody has an idea, uh -huh. uh, we are very open to collaborations. Uh, like we are also sending fresh tissue to uh, quite a bit of collaborator. That, that's a little bit trickier because like uh, we have to collect it and then somebody has to ship it. Uh, but if somebody here, since you are all at UCSD, is interested, right. that we can call you and you can come and pick up your samples and do right. like if somebody wants... We have a few people here that are interested, like for example, Chris Glass, uh, he was interested in brain. And so one of his uh, postdoc will mm -hmm. just come in uh, and pick up the brain uh, mm -hmm. when we were doing our autopsy. So mm -hmm. that's an option. They can have access to the fresh tissues too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do remember we do flow, we do collect a fresh uh, tissue for flow cytometries mm -hmm. right, while doing the rapid autopsy. Yeah, yeah. We'll, also yeah. Great. Yeah, Jimmy yeah. joined us once in, uh, and Mitchell too. I saw he's here. He also. Yeah, Mitchell is us. here. Yeah. <laughs> so we we are more than happy. Like if somebody's interested to help, like we are open. Um, it's a great experience, uh, and um, we always need people because we, you know, we need need a lot of people to help. And uh, like if somebody goes in vacation or like. It's always exactly. hard. So having more people that volunteer is always good. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I, I was um, fortunate. Like a 10, 15 people working together and uh, get all the tissues as fresh as possible and uh, snap frozen. Um, it, it's amazing. It's a great experience for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And if you volunteer, you will be called because. <laughs> 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 because poor Gigi, she, she said, yes, you can call me. But then I don't know if she really thought in the middle of like at 3 a.m. I, I did call her and woke, woke her up. So when, uh, so when when we have to do it, we have to do it. And so we, we have we, we are we don't have much time. And so we right, just yes. wake Thanks. everyone up and, yeah. and just try to get as many people as possible to yeah. join us. And me and Davy, like a lot of people, I see a lot of the team is here, right? We we participate to almost all of our own autopsies. We like to be there first mm -hmm. line. Any more questions from the audience? If no, we're gonna thank you. Thank you, Sarah, Dr. Gianena for this uh, awesome talk and uh, sharing this uh, super interesting projects with us. Thank you. Well, Take thank care. you.
Bye. 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 Take care, everyone. Bye.